Welcome. It is so good to be here. My name is Anthony. I am the director of outreach for LRCC, representing camps El Camino Pines and Luther Glen Farm. I love music. It is part of my DNA, and camp is so heavily involved with music. It is the heart of what we do. So I invite you to please stand. I invited some of my friends to join me in this. I am a drummer. I'm not a guitarist. So a lot of what I do is with rhythm. And so with rhythm, there comes dancing. And one of my favorite songs to sing is We Are Marching in the Light of God. I will call out the different verses, whether we are clapping, we are dancing, we are snapping, or we are praying. Follow along. I have some of my friends here. Um, Emily Ersman is one of our alumni of LRCC. I'm here with some other friends, too. So follow along. Let's get our feet moving. Let's do some exercise for Lord. Here we go. We are marching in the light of God. 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 in the light of God. We are clapping. We are clapping in the light of God. 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 We are clapping. We are clapping. Oh, we are clapping in the light of God. We are clapping in the light of God. We are dancing. We are snapping. We are snapping in the light of God. We are snapping. We are snapping in the light of God. We are snapping in the light of God. We are snapping. We are snapping. Oh, we are snapping in the light of God. We are snapping. We are snapping. Oh. In the light. We are singing nice and loud. Here we go. We are singing. We are singing in the light of God. We are singing in the light of God. We are singing in the light of God. Amen. Thank you. As each as our assembled group is coming back together, and many of them are stopping off at the uh, coffee station so they can prepare themselves for the afternoon. I do know what happens when you languish outside in such a beautiful and certainly a majestic campus like it is and then have lunch. It's kind of hard to return to a business session. But I do have a question. Can someone tell me how the turkey was? I've been carrying mine around for the last hour. At some point, lunch will I have an opportunity to, to dine. We, you know, we had our workshop, and I wanted to make sure I was uh, doing my uh, due diligence by being there and participating. So I've been carrying this box around for a while. So thank you for letting me know that I've got something uh, certainly to look forward to. I think we're almost there. 
We will begin this session, this afternoon session, uh, with some additional information and instruction. And by that, I'd like to call upon the Reverend Melissa Maxwell Doherty, who is the Vice President for Mission and Identity at Cal Lutheran University. And if by chance you are making connections, there was another Maxwell Doherty here earlier. That is not by accident. They have an incredible team in ministry. Pastor. Thank you, Randy. It is an honor to be one of the 26 colleges and universities of the ELCA. We treasure this lively connection because of the values of our church. You pr I got an amen, fantastic. <laughs> Forgiveness and reconciliation. Wow, do we need that. Dignity, compassion, and justice. Inclusion, courage, and openness to change. What church does that? I mean, really, our church does. Faithful stewardship of God's creations and gifts. These values inform how we are a university together because we are a church together. These values propel our mission. Well, you probably know that we are the youngest of the 26 colleges of the ELCA. We're barely 60 years old. And when we ask ourselves, who are the neighbors we are to love? This is what we know. Our student body includes 4,383 students, graduates and undergraduates. 47% of our students comes from minority, minoritized populations. In addition, 8% of our students are international students. And of the students within our undergraduate population, 27% are the first in the family to go to a college or university. You should come to one of our commencements. We celebrate. These are our neighbors. These are the ones we will love. You told us that this summer we're going to be voting on this, a declaration of our interreligious inter commitment. We studied it with the help of our uh, Luther scholar at our seminary, Kiersey Sterna. And we live this out every day on this campus. And we're so excited that you're going to wrestle with this document that means so much to this university. Now, Randy, you said there are things that are worth getting up in the morning. This university is worth getting up and going to work each day. It has been a really hard year. You heard from our president that this is a really hard year, and I have a video to show you in a little bit. But he talk, talked to you about these twin tragedies, this shooter line at Borderline Bar and Grill, and you know when you're grieving, it, it's time. It takes time. And then within 24 hours, there was those fires that affected this whole neighborhood and beyond. And I want to tell you that there are two things that sustained us. Your prayers and your comfort and your compassion. I'm telling you, pastors from Pacifica and Southwest California just showed up to accompany our pastors and our rabbi and our faculty as we work to care for our students and the mercies of God that sustain you in a time of tragedy. And that mercy of God that comes to you as you realize that God has formed us in community and we don't have to go it alone. And this is a place where you can be broken. And this is a place where you can begin to experience healing and resiliency. I turn your attention to this video. Thank you. 
How can anyone plan for what happened to us last fall? How can anyone be ready to experience such loss in our community? Mental, emotional, and even physical pain has been stirred up inside each of us. The fire has singed our land, leaving it burnt and charred. The storms that came both from the sky and our eyes have shed almost the equivalence in rainfall. Rain that has flooded our streets and slid down our cheeks. Although so much has affected us, we still remain resilient. The waters that have fallen have made it possible for new life to take its course. Where there was pain, we emerge and sprout like buds of new life. The area is growing and starting to heal, as are we. Our land and our community remain resilient. Many community members have blossomed and shown us what it means to be truly resilient. The facilities crew carrying propane tanks through scorched fields to supply power to the KCLU radio signal, the counseling and psychological service team and their readiness during the wake of the tragedy, mission and identity, organizing and distributing quilts to our community, providing a sense of warmth and comfort. We start anew. Inside many of us, life is returning and returning to these areas as well. Our environment and our community are healing beautifully. It is because of the strength of our community and your support that we have remained resilient during these challenging times. We thank you for everything. Something beautiful has come out of sadness. Our community, tied together like strong oak roots, will grow back and stand tall once again. second word of thanks. And this one comes to you, Bishop Irwin. You heard last night that we received this fantastic million dollar grant from the Lilly Foundation, the thriving leadership formation that benefits rostered leaders, deacons, pastors, to build up your skills so that you may thrive. And truly, I believe the reason we receive this is because of bishops like yourself writing a letter and for you, Bishop Andy, and the 11 other bishops in our regions one and two that stood in solidarity beside us and said, we can work together to educate leaders. And we say, thank you. It is an honor to be a college of the ELCA. It matters. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague in ministry, Sarah Wilson, who's going to update you about our seminary, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley. Thank you, God be with you. Well, it is a joy and a privilege uh, to be with you, the people of the Southwest California Synod. Uh, I serve as Associate Director of Seminary Relations up in PLTS. Uh, we are centered in the heart of Berkeley, but I feel like I need to say welcome home to you here too, because we are very much part of California Lutheran University. And so I want to say that God is good and God is doing amazing things. And I thank you for your partnership over our 50 plus year history, but particularly these last five years that the seminary has been a part of the university. God is doing great things. We share things like faculty. And I, if is Kiersey here, could she just raise her hand? So our Luther study, Luther Reformation faculty, Kiersey Sterna is here. And this is a partnership of, with the Southwest California Synod. So thank you for that. I want to lift up some of our amazing students who you have identified and who you are supporting through seminary 
to be the future pastors and deacons of the ELCA. Uh, Mark Moore, are you here? If you're here, raise your hand. Mark is finishing his internship in your synod. Let's give him a round of applause. You have another student, Libby Denton, who is currently beginning her uh, CPE. So she is serving and learning in a hospital this summer as a chaplain. You also have another student, Linda Solberg, who is a member of Our Saviors in Lancaster. Let's give Linda a hand. And I want to express my thanks to congregations like Our Saviors, who are truly giving new life in this new chapter. They're also making a very significant gift to the seminary for scholarships. So thank you very much. I'm going to take this opportunity to pause. Uh, we have also developed a video for the purpose of helping us lift up leaders for the church and to share the message from Berkeley through the voices of our students and our rector, Ray Pickett. Who we are is how we show up in the world. And so when you start showing up in the world, you impact it it impacts you and that that gets internalized it creates a whole different dynamic in the seminary and in the church we're trying to invite students into a kind of a holistic understanding of what it means to be a formed person of faith there is something about plts that i've not really seen at any other seminaries they have redesigned their school and their curriculum and calling these faculties from all these different walks of life to be able to show people what this world can be like. I felt like I was going to be able to get a more robust and well-rounded theological education that takes into account that there are lots of other people in the world. PLTS has helped me learn church leadership that goes beyond the congregation to participation in the community. We are an urban seminary. Now that we are in the center of Berkeley, I think that that is an awesome attribute to our school because it forces us to encounter people who are different than us and who are similar to us, and it's a beautiful thing. It's this being here that's transformative. Seminary can help us to further that faith, but also more critically engage it. PLTS would be great for a person who wants to do real change in the world, who wants to change the church and is looking for new ways to do church. If you come here, you're going to have to engage in the world. You're going to have to open yourself up to a variety of experiences and let that impact you. Thank you for supporting the seminary, and may God be with you always. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Melissa. It is now my opportunity and pleasure to um, ask if Ms. Samantha Henderson can join us as we begin to transition, frankly, from the uh, opportunity to vote by paper to the 20 cent 21st century phenomena called the electronic devices. Um, I also have a request. Um, uh, the updated candidate information is in your guidebook, and I'm updating guidebook as I receive information. So if you're using guidebook, please make sure to use the refresh button so that new information can be populated to your device. Um, I'm introducing uh, Tanya DeMotz from Quizdom, who is well experienced in our assemblies, uh, to give you a demonstration of your voting devices. Thank you. Can I have my slides, please? Awesome. How are you guys doing this afternoon? All right. All right, if you would please take out your Quizdom remote. Um, to turn on the remote, you just click the, um, the menu button 
and you just hold it down for a few seconds, it'll go to find net and then quiz them when it has connected. At the end of the session, it should turn off by itself, but if you notice that your remote is still on, you can always turn it off by holding down that menu key again. So it's just gonna take a few moments for everybody's remote to connect. If your remote says low battery, just raise your hand and somebody will be by with a fresh remote for you. If it says push key or no net, just hit the double arrow key, your remote has gone to sleep. If it says help, it's okay, just wait for a few seconds, it'll clear out and you'll be back in the session. I see somebody's coming with the remotes right there for you guys. Um, push the arrow key, the double arrow key one more time. Okay, so I'm gonna go through how to do voting and then we'll try some fun voting questions out. Go, go to the microphone. If you have a question, please come to the microphone or are you just waiting for a replacement remote? Batteries. He's, he's coming around, I see him. Okay, so I'm gonna just quickly go over how to do voting, and then by that time, I think everybody will have the remotes up, and then we'll try some fun practice slides. Okay, so when there is a live voting slide, you just make your selection using the keypad, so you hit A, B, C, or D, and then you hit the double arrow key to submit your answer. Now in most cases, you will see a check and an X confirming your vote has been submitted. But sometimes with groups this sizes, it takes a little bit to get that back. But as long as you hit the send key while the vote is still active, we have collected your vote. If at any time you need to make a change, simply hit the clear or the C button, clear out your response, resubmit your response, and then hit the double arrow key to submit your vote. So. How are we all doing? It looks like we're doing pretty good. You will see this slide just as a reminder to take out your vote and let you know that it's time to turn on your vote and get ready to vote, so. All right, let's try some fun questions out. What was Martin Luther's favorite beverage? So make your selection A, gin fuzz, B, beer, C, milk, D, coffee. Now we're just gonna wait for a few moments while everybody submits that answer. Remember, make your selection A, B, C, or D, and then hit the double arrow key to send. Okay, I'm just gonna close this out, close the vote. And now let's see the results. All right, B, now let's see if you guys are correct. All right, good work everybody. <laughs> All right, so this is another kind. So notice that your screen is blank. You, you may see this, yeah. <laughs> this is a funny, and this is, this, there's no right, wrong answer. I, this is just a survey of the room to see um, how long the ideal sermon is. So, and notice that your remote is blank. It's okay, so go ahead and choose one, two, three, four, five, or six, and then hit the double arrow key to submit. And since this is just for fun, I'm gonna close this just a little bit early, so we're gonna close the vote. All right, and let's see what you guys think. <laughs> so number four was the most popular, so let's see what that was. Number four is 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, we have one more. You guys are doing awesome. 
is this your first time to attend a synod assembly? And notice again, you have your choices on your screen. Please select A, B, C. Make your selections and hit the double arrow key to submit your answer. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this just a bit early. Okay, the voting has been closed. Let's see how many. All right, so B, 182. So this is, a lot of you guys have good experience. That's great. All right, well that ends the tutorial. You guys did awesome, and thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Now you all know we'll do it again slowly the first time we use them. Um, I just want to point out also that these things are precious and we need to have them back. They have no other conceivable use besides that which we have for them here. They will not work as remotes for your TV. So please don't go home with them. Um, I would like to call on the secretary for a credentials report. Thank you, Reverend Chair. As of 2 p.m., there are now 94 pastors in our voting member base for 30% and 224 laity for 70% of the voting base. There are four deacons, 20 synod council members, and an even 200 congregational lay voting members for a total voting member strength of 318. Of those, 155, or 49%, are male, 163, or 51%, are female, 76, or 24%, are persons of color or whose lang first language is other than English, and 26, or 8%, are under the age of 30. There are 71 visitors in attendance for a total attendance of 389. Reverend Chair, I present the credentials report and move its adoption. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Yes, there is. Hello. Yes. I'm Stephanie Zong, and I have a point of information. Um, I wanted to ask about what the intent is of grouping together people of color with people whose fir uh, first language is not English. Uh, the short answer to that is that we use the same standards and categories as the National Church in its record keeping. That's, and that's, they, they put both together in the same category. Okay, and um, so forgive me if I don't totally understand parliamentary procedures, but is it possible that I can propose an amendment to the language to separate those two things out because it does perpetuate an inaccurate picture of English speakers as being you know, completely non-white, which, um, so that category for myself as a person of color, I only identify with half. And I think it also helps us move forward in our initiatives around separating language from race and ethnicity for us to really do the inclusive social mm -hmm. justice work that we're all committed here to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Shall we use the machines? You ready for that, Tanya, to use the machines, yes or no? Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. A, yes. B, no. You may vote now. Yes is to accept. No is to not accept. Vote now. Okay. Anybody having trouble with the voting? Point of order. Yes? Yes. Steve, Steve Jerby, Bethel Encino. I believe that there was a motion to amend the credentials. I would like to second that and ask for a ruling from the chair. All right. I didn't hear that as a, as a motion. I heard it as, as a suggestion. Since it is a, a change to, to our governing documents, it's out of order at this time, but it could be introduced in new business in the last session of the Assembly. Thank you for the clarification. So has everybody been able to vote? 
Voting is closed. Let's see the results. Good. The credentials report is adopted. Thank you for the practice vote on that. I'd like to turn the chair back to Pastor Malki Pika Padilla for the report on the second ballot for bishop. The result of the second ballot is as follows. 279 legal ballot cast, 209 needed for election. Rostin Comer, four. Eric Ronquist, seven. Stephanie Jaeger, three. Sheldon Hess, three. L.B. Tatum, 23. Pamela Charles, 41. Guy Irwin, 186. There is no election in this ballot. According to our procedures, the seven nominees plus Ty will move forward to the third ballot. In this case, everyone who was on the second ballot will go on to the third ballot. Prior to the third ballot, each nominee will have five minutes to address the assembly. There are two nominees that are not physically present at this assembly. They will address the assembly uh, electronically. Uh, that third ballot is scheduled to happen in business session five that will start at 7 p.m. tonight. Thank you, Pastor Mampika Padilla. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce my, again, my colleague, Bishop Andy Taylor from the Pacifica Synod, who's going to lead us in Bible study too. Yes. William Hurst, First Torrance, member of the Bishop's Election Committee. I believe that the third ballot has been called for during this business session, session number four. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's scheduled for 4.30. Sorry. Thank you. It was the other ballot that would have been later. Sorry, I'm a little bit uh, befuddled by that. That's a, uh, we have unusually a two-track process here where I do the business part and someone else does the election part, and we're not fully in sync. I ask your indulgence. Bishop Taylor, are you prepared for the Bible study? We welcome you. I actually prepared a PowerPoint for you. I did more work for you than I did for my own synod, so there you go. <laughs> what I'm going to do is have you start out um, by talking to each other. Um, and here's how we're going to work this. I want you not necessarily to talk to um, people from your congregation, but if you turn around or look forward, there's probably somebody from a different congregation who's right in front or behind you. Just move your chairs so that you can have a conversation with them. What we're going to do is um, we're going to go to the next slide. And uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11, a nice short passage. I'm going to read it through twice. At the end, I'm going to give you about five minutes to answer these questions. What word, phrase, or image stands out for you as you hear this passage? And there's going to be a list of qualities in there. Which of these is stronger for you and which of these is more of a challenge? I'll put these questions up after we've read it twice, but we're going to put up the text right now.
So, 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. A second time. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Five minutes starting now. You guys could actually talk to each other. You can do this. We never talked to each other. No, no, go ahead. We sent each other. You know each other. Anything stand out to you? Love covers a multitude of sins. I was thinking about the litany that I have.
One minute warning, one minute. Thirty seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's come back together. Thank you for having a conversation with each other. I'm going to talk about some of these qualities a little bit, uh, share just some reflections with you. And uh, I don't have a, an opportunity for feedback at this time, but as you see me in the hallways or others, if there are things about this study that came to mind that you don't hear from me, uh, um, there are things that I can learn, I'd, I'd appreciate for hearing from you as well. We're going to start with love, the next slide. First of all, um, love, uh, we've had a lot of speakers talk about it. One of the things I think about love, the uh, first one is that it's, when we're commanded to love, we're commanded to an action, not necessarily a feeling. We are called to love people that we don't even like. You ever been called to love somebody you don't like? Absolutely. And so what does love mean? Love means how do you treat that person? How do you show respect? How do you show care? Do you pray for that individual? You know, sometimes I've just disliked somebody and I get so annoyed with God because as I pray for them, I find that God gives me compassion or kindness, sort of what Emily was talking about earlier for her uh, not so, so much a friend Taylor that uh, welled up inside of her. God works that in us when we do the loving thing for others. So the feeling may follow, but we're commanded first to the action. Second thing I want to make sure we understand about love is that love is not a sentimental holding on but love allows us even to let go. Uh, my father died of Alzheimer's last year. We got to the point where um, he was fearful all the time. He didn't know who we were. He didn't know that he was living in the house he had lived in for 50 years. He didn't know um, much of anything, and he was always afraid. So he ended up with a respiratory infection. We were told by some healthcare professionals that we could get that cured, but the doctors asked us what we wanted to do. And what we chose to do was to let him go to God in love. Not to kill him or force anything to happen, but to allow God to take him. Because what we would have cured him for was a lifetime more of being afraid and fearful and not knowing where he was. And I equate that sometimes to church work. Sometimes we hang on to things way too long that God is saying we can let this go in love, in thankfulness for what is, and in openness to what is new. So when we Christian people are called to love, it's not just a sentimental thing. We are called to actions of love, and sometimes even to letting go. I want to talk about hospitality. Hospitality in a congregation means that you at least say hello to people. I mean, it means more than that. But I can't tell you how often I hear from people whose job it is to visit churches that nobody says hello to them unless they know who they are. If you talk to spouses of, of uh, synod staff members, to spouses of uh, bishops, you often find out that they're sitting looking at the bulletin board because nobody says hello. It's good to at least acknowledge somebody's existence. Now, we know that hospitality goes far beyond what I'm saying right here, but it at least starts with a hello. And it looks into other things that are welcoming. But I would also say this about hospitality in a congregation. We want to avoid what I call slobbery dog syndrome. 
I used to go and visit friends. They had a dog who loved having attention, who loved being petted, and I would start to scratch the dog, and the dog would drool all over me. It enjoyed so much. And so, you, you know, all of a sudden your hands are filled with stuff that you hadn't asked for. <laughs> and that can happen in congregations too. Have you ever seen somebody who was so overly friendly to somebody who was a newcomer and was trying to talk them into membership from the very first moment that they got there? It's what I call slobbery dog syndrome. An appropriate hello, uh, uh, who are you? How can we be of assistance? All of those things are good. And of course, we know hospitality goes beyond this. It goes into a way that we form welcome for others, others who are in need, for the homeless among us, for those who are on the margin. This is where hospitality um, uh, moves to. But it often begins with these kinds of uh, common, everyday senses of hospitality among those who you have not yet met. I often tried to say to congregations I served, you don't know if that person's your next best friend until you say hello. You don't know if this is the person God has sent particularly to help you in the future if you don't first say hello and be open to them. So I'd encourage you, especially in congregational life, before you say hello to each other, say hello to somebody you don't know all that well and uh, spend a little time with them and then go to be with your friends. They'll hang out for you. Um, but this is a way that you can practice hospitality congregationally. Gifts. Um, you want to do what you're good at. Um, that's what gifts are all about. But um, sometimes some of the things that I've, um, you can go to the next one too. Sometimes the next things that I've learned about gifts in the past have been, well, it's whatever you do naturally. Whatever comes to you kind of naturally, those are your gifts. Otherwise, they're skills that you have to develop. I, I'm not so sure that that's true. I think sometimes when you utilize your gifts, you struggle. Sometimes there's suffering that comes from using those gifts. Sometimes you, do a gift, you use your gift and you find that you don't want to use it anymore, but that's what people are asked to do. Last night I was talking to somebody who said they were always asked to chair things, and they knew that that was a gift, but, um, but they tried to do other things, but most recently they had been asked to chair something, and they had to end up doing, saying yes to that, even though it wasn't necessarily what they wanted to do. Try, consider to yourself, what is God calling you to do? If your gift is leadership, don't be surprised that you're asked to lead. And, uh, and maybe that's the exact thing that God is calling you to do for the, next, uh, for the next thing. If your gift is service, don't be surprised if people ask you to serve. So that's just something about gifts. So do what comes naturally to you, but then don't be afraid to try different gifts. But also, don't just say no because you've done it before. It could be that God needs you to use that gift one more time to do what God needs you to do. Speaking God's word. Um, this is my favorite verse in the Bible um, from Galatians uh, chapter 2. I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We do not live alone. We aren't even just followers of Jesus. This verse promises, and I think it's true, that God lives in and through us and utilizes us. When we follow Jesus, what we're doing is saying no to that part of ourselves that doesn't want to follow so that God's yes might be uh, fulfilled in and through us. And sometimes God th speaks through us in ways that we are unaware of or that we don't even know are happening at different times in our lives. I want to tell you a story about this. I have a good friend, sadly passed away a couple of years. Um, he was a Lutheran pastor for years. We uh, um, became friends because we were both youth ministers together, and we both liked drinking craft beer together. And, uh, and then my friend at, at one point decided that he wanted, to own, he wanted to own a beer bar. He looked all over San Diego County for where he could open this beer bar. He had partners. Uh, um, and one day he gave me a call at my church. He said, I found where I'm opening my beer bar. I said, where? He said, that, you know the strip mall right next to your church? I said, this is either the best or the worst thing that has ever happened to me. Turned out to be one of the best. I, uh, I would go in there to have a pint at the end of the day, visit with my friends, and end up meeting people I otherwise would never have met. One day I was in there at the bar talking to my buddy. He had to go and do some work. The guy next to me started talking to me, and uh, we were chit-chatting it up. And the guy said to me, what do you do for a living? And I said to him, I'm the pastor of the church on the corner. He said, oh, that's nonsense. The word he used wasn't really nonsense. I'm not going to use the word he used. 
He went on to say, I don't see how any adult could believe that. Maybe when you're a kid and having trouble falling asleep at night, but how any adult could believe that that fairy tale is true is beyond me. Then he looked at me and said, no offense. <laughs> and I said, I'm just drinking a beer here. Well, I got to know the guy because he was a regular. I was a regular. This was my friend's uh, beer bar. I was going to let him drive me out. We never talked about church after that. We talked about all kinds of other things, sports and kinds of bar chat that you have, and I uh, got to know the guy. So about a year after I first met him, I came into the bar, and he was there, and his face was as long as I've ever seen it. He looked very sad. I said, it looks like you're having a bad day. He said, you have no idea. And he went on to tell me what was going on. I'm not going to share the details of that, but it had to do with courts. It had to do with family. It had to do with all kinds of things going on in his life. It took him 10 minutes to tell me all these terrible things that he was shouldering, all these burdens that he had. And at the end of that conversation, at the end of that, you know, not conversation, he was just spilling his guts to me. At the end of that, I just looked at him and he said, I'm really sorry but it just didn't seem to be enough, you know? And so I looked at him and I said, I know you're not a man of faith, but I am. Would you mind if I prayed for you about this? And he surprised me by saying, you know, I think I kind of like that. Well, the next few times I came into the bar, he'd say, are you praying? I'd say, yeah. He said, well, I got a few more things for you to pray about. And then when everything uh, resolved itself in a way that was good, he asked me, he said, would you say a prayer of thanks to your God that, you had, that this happened? And toward the end of my time at that beer bar, because I got elected bishop and had to move out of that place, uh, he, uh, he was saying to me, um, I've been thinking of coming to church, but I'm afraid God would strike the building with lightning if I showed up. I said, well, then come to our 8 or 11 o'clock service. That's in our old building. That's got to go anyway. We could use the sweet insurance money. <laughs> well, he never showed up. But he went a long ways from that's nonsense to I'd like to come to church. And, you know, I didn't say very much. I didn't say even what a pastor has to say. I said what any Christian could say. Do you mind if I pray for you about this? It was interesting where God took him without my being there, just through words that I said. It wasn't my doing. It was God's. God is at work in and through each and every one of you every day in ways you don't recognize. Remember that the words you speak are God's words. They may come back and surprise you in the effect that they've had, but God is at work in and through you because God does speak through you. Serve. Next one. Serve is all about doing what is best for your neighbor. It's not about getting your jollies out of saying, what a good servant I am. Sometimes, you know, Jesus in serving the neighbor told them what they didn't like to hear and didn't do for them what they wanted to have happen. Peter didn't want his feet washed. The Pharisees didn't want to hear that they weren't being welcoming to others. Jesus served them by speaking the truth in love. So we do what is best for our neighbor, and Christ is our example in all of that. I think I have one more there. Nope. So let's move on. So Christ is our example just means that Christ lives in and through us, and we speak the truth in love and say what Christ would have us do. So next slide, please. So the final question, I want you to get back into your groups. I'm going to give you how much time do we have left? We got about five minutes left. Um, and so I'm going to um, ask you this final question. I'm going to ask you to think about your congregation and think about how you are church together with them. Which of these are strengths for your congregation? Which does your congregation need to work on? And what can you be praying for your congregation about in terms of these? So you might be a more effective witness to God's love, God's power working through you, God's hospitality, God's strength, and God's service. How would these work? So turn around. We're going to take five more minutes starting right now.
One minute. Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And as you're winding up your conversations, I'd like to close this with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, thank you for living in and through us and uh, using us to share your gospel of goodness and love with all in our world. 
Help us to uh, love as you would have us love. Be as hospitable to others as you are to us. Thank you for the gifts that we have. Help, them, help us to use them as you call us to do so. Help us to serve as you have served us. And help us to speak your word in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Taylor. Now I'd like to call on the Vice President to uh, come and present the constitutional changes that were introduced earlier, and to list any that were lifted out of on block. We'd consider those first, and then we would consider the remainder as an on block motion. As we provided instruction yesterday, and certainly affirm that instruction today, uh, we provided you with a form called Constitutional Changes. It was an opportunity to secure five signatures for any aspect of the Constitution that required that you would like to have lifted from the in block vote and discussed separately. We have one that came in at the two o'clock cutoff time, and that, uh, bring, uh, that has to do with S121202. Give you a moment to look that up in guidebook or in the books on your tables under resolutions Look under section 12, conferences, clusters, coalitions, and other area subdivisions. And at the very bottom of the page, you'll see S121202. As you take a look at that, I would also ask you to take a look at the similar continuing resolutions, which are found on the second page. It's S1212A18 and a, a B18. If you combine those two continuing resolutions, you'll find that it looks exactly like the bylaw that's just above it. This was brought to our attention as one of the clerical matters that needed to be addressed. According to Robert's rules, if the contextual framework of the Constitution is, does not change, and it's a clerical matter, it can be done through the uh, Senate Council. Yes. Um, for those of us, oh, there it's on. Uh, for those of us that Name? are using the guidebook, um, yes. can you please clarify where we oh, can sure. find the, the material? Bottom of page 21, top of page 22. In guidebook. Oh. Samantha, um, the constitutional changes, I believe you look on the work, workshops first and then drill down the constitutional changes and then drill down to chapter 12 and then down to subsection 1202. They're linked in the workshops and under agenda. Mm -hmm. There should be a category for constitution and it's linked in there as a PDF. Right. Exactly. Did you find it, Pastor? Did you go to work workshops? Okay, you're close. Is there someone next to her who's found it who can help? Got it, okay. We will be lifting 12-12-02 and discussing that separate from the balance of the Constitution. And this would, this would be a time for those who wish to speak to that to come to a microphone. We have five persons who have identified the opportunity to extract this from the Const total constitutional uh, vote, and they come from Bethel, American, and Adore. If any one of them would like to approach, please go ahead. My name is Steve Jerby, pastor at Bethel Encino, a proud congregation of the Twin Valleys Conference. Uh, the reason I wanted to pull this out is because as it stands, larger congregations have the opportunity to influence the outcomes of conference assemblies. Simply by bringing more people to the room, a larger congregation can outnumber a smaller congregation, whereas the previous provision allowed for council and SIND assembly voting representatives to have voice and vote at assembly matters. This becomes even more important as we look at properties 
that are um, being put up for sale and conferences that are organizing to use funds, as has happened with the Christ the King property in our conference and the strategic visioning process that our conference has undergone. What I want to do is make sure that smaller congregations have an equal voice and vote at conference assemblies. This also privileges congregations with full-time pastors because we know that when pastors are serving in part-time calls, their availability to engage in conference work is limited. And if pastoral leadership is limited at the conference level, that often results in limited engagement at a congregational level. So I would ask that this provision be removed from the amendment and that we revert to the original uh, constitution which calls for council members and assembly delegates to have voice and vote at conference assemblies. Thank you. Thank you. That having come through a nomination form, it doesn't need a second. It's, it's already been seconded by the other signers. Is there further discussion? of this provision. Thank you. Mark Witte, Christ the Shepherd, also a part-time pastor. Hey, at Christ the Shepherd, we load up our conference assembly uh, with people from our congregation. Just make sure Come a little closer up. to the microphone, please. Um, I just say that at Christ the Shepherd, uh, we make it a point, even though I am part-time, and I don't often attend collegiate meetings, we make it a point to bring a lot of people to conference assemblies. And, um, you know, I, you know, we had an occasion like that where an election came up and I had too many people there. I think they decided it would be unfair if they had an election for Senate Council because I had so many people there. So we had a coin flip, and here I am. So it can work either way, and by making it necessary to have all those council members there, I think it makes it harder to put into practice. So if you're worried about being in a small congregation or being a part-time pastor, don't worry. You can work the system. Thank you. Any more discussion? As I understand the proposal, it is to remove this section from what is being considered in constitutional changes and it would revert to the previous constitutional language. Is that correct? Good, I just want to make sure that's right. May Any, I speak to that? Pardon me? May I speak to that? Yes, please. Do I need to go to the other mic? No, I think you can. you're doing explanatory work here on the committee. Okay. The reason why the change occurred, uh, we canvassed with the conference deans the way in which they operate their conference assemblies. There are nine conferences. They are geographically dispersed. In certain conferences, there may be a distance of 45 or 50 miles between congregations. In other conferences, you can walk down the street to the neighboring congregation. We found that in the practice of the last four or five years, conference assemblies were open to anyone they did not necessarily be, be, need to be a council member, and frankly, they were not often the voting member from the previous assembly. What we found is that over time, we had opened up the doors to conference assemblies for several reasons. One, it was an avenue, a, a, a venue, if you will, for new information. And second and apart, it gave opportunity for people to feel engaged and involved. And so part of our option with the Constitution was to ensure that we adopted the practices for which we have been engaged in over several years. This is one of those practices. We have had this going on for quite some time where our conferences were open to anyone who wanted to come and be part of that exchange and that sharing of information. It is a microcosm of our time together just as this is and all we did is adapt our past practice. Thank you for that explanatory note. The question before the assembly is whether to approve section S12.12.02 as it is presented as a constitutional change or not to, which in which case the previous constitutional language for that 
section would be retained. Is there any further discussion? Sorry to be repeating that. I just want to make it absolutely clear what is being voted on. I don't see anybody else preparing to discuss this, so I think we can proceed to a vote. Let's try the machines again. You'll be asked to vote yes, no, or abstain. Yes is to affirm the constitutional provision as it is presented with both black and green type. No is to reject the changes and revert to the previous um, language. Abstain, of course, is to abstain. Is everybody clear on that? We're talking about S12.12.02 only of the entire Constitution. Good. So, if there is someone who has a point of order, you need to make yourself really clear. Point of privilege. Yes. Please repeat on that. That's what everyone Okay, I will for. say it again. Thank you. What is at issue in this vote, yes or no vote, is whether to accept the changes as presented in the Constitution to Section S12.12.02, so as it is presented to you with both black and green type, that would to vote yes is to accept it as it is. To vote no is to reject the change, in which case it reverts back to previous constitutional language. It's a pretty narrow focus, but I think it's clear. Is everybody okay with that? Good. Well, we'll try a vote then. Yes is to accept, no is to reject, and abstain is to abstain. You may vote now. Raise your hand and somebody can come and help you. If you have a non-functioning machine. Yeah. It requires a, a two-thirds vote to pass, by the way. All of the constitutional provisions require two-thirds votes to be affirmed. Has the problem been resolved? Thank you. Tanya, is the, are you ready? One over here. Somebody give some assistance on this side. Do you have a neighbor perhaps who's Familiar with the machines? We only have one helper. Hang on, hold tight. Okay, we're switching out a, a voting machine. We are voting in the light of God. Maybe we should have Anthony come up and play the drum a bit. <clears throat> It's best to work these things out now. Mm -hmm. 
who is still waiting for help. Great, we'll let Tanya get back to her desk. Voting still open? Okay. Voting is now closed. And we'll see the results. Excellent. It's 100. 189 to We're going to check to see if it's two thirds. We need to add them up. Abstentions there. Abstentions don't count. So it is two thirds. All right. The the motion that the uh, provision is adopted. We have two thirds. Abstentions don't count against the total. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, the technology is supposed to make things easier, but there are always some hitches at the beginning. Reverend Chair, I present to you the Constitution and Bylaws of the Southwest California Senate, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in, of, in America, as edited through November 2018, as presented to the Senate, Count, Senate Assembly at its meeting in 2018, and equally presented to the Senate Assembly in 2019 for adoption. Thank you. The rest of the provisions have been presented now on block. Is there any discussion? Yes. Could you please announce the number of votes yes. for each thing, yes, uh, we will. each topic, and uh, explain why they don't add up to the total number of votes? Yes, we will do that. Just keep in mind the general rule that abstentions don't count against a percentage total. Two-thirds were required for that vote. It was 148 to 48. Yeah. Thank you. I will be careful to do that. It's, I can't, they're behind me, so I have to make a special effort to do that. Thank you for the reminder. So now before us is the rest, the remainder of the constitutional provisions all in one. Anyone? have discussion on that? You may head to a microphone if you do. I don't see movement. Good, so I guess we're ready for that vote too. So again, the same procedure. To vote yes is to accept the constitutional changes as presented last year and again this year. To vote no is to reject them. To vote to abstain is to withdraw from the voting in a sense, but to register your presence. So, you may vote now. Again, this requires a two-thirds majority. We keep the voting open as long as signals are being sent to the monitor. It's not until they have stopped that we close the voting. The voting is closed. Let's see the results. The votes in favor are 223. The votes against are 18. And there are 10 abstentions. The provisions uh, have passed. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Foster and your committee for their long and hard work stretching over two years. Absolutely. Thank you.
I'd like to present Keisha Waller. Weller, yes, sorry, Weller. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, man. My, uh, my name is um, Keisha Weller, and I'm from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in San Monica with the Baptist James Bling. Woo! My, uh, my best prayer is Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I'm God. The command to be still forces us to think on two things. That we, are, that we, as human beings, are subject to limitations, and God is infinite. That being the case, we need to drop our hands, go limp, and chill out. Christian people ought to come behold the works of God, that we may enjoy a confidence in him who gave us his son. If we adopt the thinking of Psalm 46, should, should we expect the miraculous deliverance from trouble? No, of course not. First, God does not need to work a miracle to help us in trouble. Secondly, the miracles of the past continue to teach us. John 20, verse 30, 31. The repetition is unnecessary for the accomplishment of his will. Trust in him, believe in him, the, for the Lord has said, I will never leave you, I have never forsaken you. Knowing that God will never leave me or forsake me is a very important to me. That's why my breath prayer is Psalm 4610. I know without any doubt that God is my constant companion. While doing God's work with him to be a light bearer to help save humanity in the world today. I definitely, I do definitely believe that God has a perfect reason for everything that happens to a person in their lifetime. Even, even, um, even though, even though that some of the things that happen to a person can be quite difficult indeed, God is always teaching us how to rise above the difficulties that life offers us. I have found that as I go through difficult things in life, my faith towards God and Jesus Christ, our beloved Lord, deepens. At the age of 30 years old, I received my call from God and Jesus Christ to, um, to be the direct light bearer for God and profound love for humanity. That's the exact age that Jesus Christ, our Savior, started his own public ministry for humanity. When I was still in high school, I had seriously thought that I was going to become a Lutheran pastor. However, God had other plans for my specific call for him. I became a disability rights advocate for God. And when I was in junior high school, I was a total introvert, very shy, and I wouldn't even imagine I'd be doing public speaking. However, when I acknowledged God, my beloved Holy Father, um, I was, I turned into an extrovert. Yay, man! I always prepare for our speech, and before I go to the speaking stage, I pray to God and give God my sincere gratitude for, uh, for being his light and allowing me to be God's pure mouthpiece for his mission. With God as my constant companion, I'm able to do public speaking like this and other mission objections for the Lord and God without fear. As a disability rights advocate, I served on the San Monica Disability Commission for 12 years. In 2012, California Governor Brown appointed me to serve a six-year term at, on the State Council of Developmental Disabilities. I made public policy that affected millions of people with developmental disabilities all around the California because I was member at large. On 2017, California Governor Brown appointed me to serve on the California State Limitation Council. Also, a other part of my mission for God is that I'm a National Abuse Awareness Profession Advocate. I want to give my sincere thanks and gratitude towards Pastor Scott Maxwell Doherty 
for developing the wedding bet. And it's been my distinct honor today to share my faith story with everybody, everybody today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Keisha Weller. We're almost due for a break, but I want to make an announcement on behalf of one of the agencies of which the, all the members of the Senate are stakeholders, and that is Solheim Senior Community, also known as Solheim Lutheran Home. How many of you have visited Solheim for any reason? Excellent. You'll know what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't, it's a wonderful elder care facility in Eagle Rock. It's quite venerable. It's been around a long time. And it is, uh, it is a, a, our pride and joy to be stakeholders in it. It belongs to the Synod uh, in the technical sense. It is separately administered as a corporation with its own board on which I sit. But because it is an agency of the Synod, you are all stakeholders in a very direct way. Your congregations are entitled to send voting members to its annual meeting. Has anyone here ever been to a Solheim annual meeting? If you have, raise your hand. Well, there's a smattering of them. I can assure you that it is not unpleasant. <laughs> they give you a very nice lunch, you meet wonderful people, and they describe the, the ministry that that agency does. The next board meeting, to which every congregation is invited to send voting members, is on Sunday, June 9th. This conflicts with a couple of other events happening the same day, LA Pride and also the service at Our Saviors in Lancaster. But for those who are not going to either of those things, the registration is at 3.30 p.m. and the meeting and dinner begin at 4 p.m. This is Solheim Senior Community, senior uh, community in, on Merton Avenue in Los Angeles. You can look it up um, on the web if you want to, and I urge you, organize a, a carpool and go from your community. You will be very warmly welcomed, and they would be very grateful for your support. They really need a good turnout of our congregational representatives in order to have a real meeting. So I play that on your heart. We have two representatives of Solheim here with us, Pastor Kathleen Richter, who serves as chaplain there, and Mr. Bill Nelson. Kathleen and Bill, are you in the room? They were earlier. Stand up, there you are. Thank you for being with us. Solheim also functions as a worshiping community of the Synod, and so it sends voting members. Thank you. So we will have a 15 minute break and reconvene at 4 p.m. No, that's wrong. That's entirely wrong. We will have a 15 minute break and convene at 345. 345.